Um, the title slide, hopefully you're in the right place where you want to be. Uh, Beethoven and Bierstadt. I'm uh, Mr. Barling from the art department. Some of the faces look familiar, and I don't know names and so on. But please uh, introduce yourself afterwards. If you have some questions, happy to chat. Uh, just a quick announcement, um, a reminder that the day continues after this session. There is a, uh, another keynote address by a visiting speaker at 2.30 in the Ralph Carey Forum. And then tonight in the White Auditorium, another uh, significant address at 7 o'clock. And then tomorrow night at 7, back in the uh, Ralph Carey Forum, uh, there's a group of business professors talking about the minimum wage as it relates to this topic. And then Friday, the community of learners is also tied in at 10 o'clock back in the forum. So there's plenty of things still happening. Uh, we're going to start, just go ahead and let you watch something for about 10 minutes. This is a, uh, I don't know if you'll call it a documentary film, but it's an independent film um, about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And I'll just leave it there. You can watch, we'll watch the first 10 minutes, and then I'll kind of explain what's going on if it's not obvious, and we'll start to unpack that, and then uh, watch a little clip on your side, tie the things together. Now, all the buttons are in the right place here. So, um, how, did it, how did it come to this? <laughs> and what are we going to do if Beethoven finds out? We're all going to be in trouble. We're all complicit. <laughs> That's why I'm nervous. So I was hired in, in 2007 to take part in the festival to celebrate Sorry, I'm the not opening sure. of the I'm World sure Festival. Sorry, I'm not sure what's up with the uh, tax uh, there. Which is one of our uh, cultural just... palaces in London. It's been refurbished. In one of the uh, uh, meetings, the preliminary meetings, um, they were discussing uh, the Ode to Joy. And the school children from Lambeth were to sing the song. And I said, because my German is not really up to scratch anymore, I'll write a couple of English verses just so I can sing it. So everyone said, oh great, that'll be good. It's really simple, even I can play it. The woman who was working with the school children, who were all um, under 11, said to me on the choir, if you do write a couple of verses, send them to me. Because the school kids were really having trouble with the literal translation of Schiller's original Ode to Joy, which goes on at some length about the Daughters of Elysium, <laughs> who was some kind of new romantic band in the 1980s. <laughs> a couple of days later, I got a phone call from the uh, organisers of the, of the event. And they said, listen, we, we, saw, we, we, we heard your, uh, your verses, we really like them. Do you think you could write the whole libretto? Would you think you could write the whole? So I'm thinking, yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> I'm a songwriter. How hard can it be? And they said, great, can you do it by Tuesday? <laughs> but uh, I promised Kerry that I would try and do it. The singable part, the, the part that... Um, that you can play on an acoustic guitar. See now like a phoenix rising from the ashes of the war. Hope of ages manifested peace and freedom evermore. Brothers, sisters, stand together. Raise your voices now as one. Though by history divided, reconciled in unison. You have to be amazed as a creative artist that Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony when he couldn't really hear properly. You know, it's, it would be beyond your, your wildest dream. Off now the chains of ancient bitterness and enmity. And they did it for the closing ceremony, 
Um, it was absolutely amazing. And then, uh, and then I did it again and invited the Queen, which was, uh, which was nice. <laughs> she hung around afterwards to shake me hand. <laughs> we got a phone call from one of her footmen. Could Her Majesty have a copy of the score signed by Mr. Bragg? If I knew she was in there, I'd have brought a t-shirt. The dedication that he gave to his work finally paid off, and it paid off big. There's absolutely no reason why someone from my background who left school when I was 16 years old who can't read music, there's no reason why that should stop me from writing the lyrics of the Ode to Joy from the Beethoven's Night Symphony. <coughs> story or an evolution story. I mean the first thing is not a thing. It's a nothing. It's all here. From Tiananmen Square, where it was played over <coughs> the loudspeakers during the revolution, to the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, where it was played when the wall fell down. It seems to express most completely what human beings are struggling for, what's possible for mankind. <laughs> This is music of transformation. It's what we dream of. It's a battle cry for humanity. every December by the performance of nine symphonies all over the country. If you are in Tokyo in December, at least 20, 30, 40 uh, Daiku performances in Tokyo.
and all over Japan, I think there will be more than 100. The creation of the peace in Japan, it's a very strange and complicated story too. The beginning of the First World War, it had been done in a German prisoner's camp. They had to take these, go these guys as prisoners to Japan. But uh, they liked the guys. They did a lot of activities, and especially they did sports, art, and music. But why did it become such a tremendous success? I, I thought that I had to, uh, to understand why it was so. Usually, uh, musics are played by professionals, even the chorus. But daiku has to have a lot of people, and even amateurs can participate in daiku singing. There are competitions, chorus competitions in Japan. all the elementary schools, junior high schools, high school. So people love singing chorus. The motivation to sing is not a passion. So I, not a passion, but I need to sing. I need to sing. To okay, that's that. I wanted to cut it right there. What was the last thing he said? I need to sing to live. And what we're looking at here today then is uh, music and art and the way that they connect with life. And by art, I mean the visual arts. Art, of course, is a big term for a lot of creative processes, but here we're kind of using shorthand for the visual art. And I'm using two examples out of many that we could have, but I'm choosing Beethoven and Bierstadt. They actually are favorites, but it made a nice alliteration for a title, so I chose them. Um, and some of these pieces fell together. Uh, this is a film that was um, put together, well, it's been in process a long time. I finally got my copy last year. It was a Kickstarter project. Kickstarters like GoFundMe, and so I threw in a couple bucks and got my copy, and um, I'm very impressed with it. From here, we don't have time to watch the whole thing, but it follows um, the phenomenon of Japan, and you kind of get the idea that it's this, people get into it, and during December, there are all these choirs all over the country singing Beethoven's Ninth. Um, it's kind of a, you know, hey, let's do it together as a community. But then the movie also profiles a uh, woman who grew up in East Germany prior to the wall coming down and what the song meant to her, learning it as a little girl, as part of German heritage, and then experiencing the wall coming down in 1989 and all those feelings of freedom that were tied up in that. Then they go to Chile, and uh, I don't know if you know the history of Chile, but in the 70s, it was a mess. There was a coup and uh, the government really clamped down and went after the opposition. A lot of people disappeared, you know, just kind of going down the street and were never seen again. And so they talked to a couple of people here who were kind of pushing back against that and the role the song played in their strivings for freedom, that too. Then finally, as you may have picked up there, Tiananmen Square, they talked to several Chinese students who were, uh, part of the Tiananmen protest, and that the song, again, was an inspiration to them. So the movie maker's thesis really is that this song is much greater than just, you know, Beethoven's, you might say, his greatest hit. You know, hey, it's a great piece of music. It seems to have some uncanny ability to connect with people around the world. And kind of, in a sense, across time. It was written in 1824, but here we are, you know, towards the end of the 20th century, now the 21st, um, still embracing this piece of music. It, you know, it's, it's a huge favor. 
We, of course, have a, another connection to it. You recognize the tune from uh, the last movement, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, is how <coughs> most of us know that from singing it in church. That is the same tune with the lyrics reworked. Okay, those are not the words that are sung in the final movement of the symphony, but the tune is taken across. And if you look at the original German, and we will in just a minute, but we actually won't look at the German, we'll look at the English translation, um, but they're, they're reasonably parallel. It's not like, you know, it's going in opposite directions. In fact, let's give me a second and I'll pull that up here. I'm trying to get my advanced certificate in technology today by doing PowerPoint and video <laughs> and not having everything crash on me. Let's just see if this will wake up. And roll over without, well, maybe. Okay. This, um, this is a poem, it was written by a guy named Schiller, that Beethoven grabbed and used. So Beethoven didn't write the lyrics for this. And the only singing in the symphony happens in the fourth movement. There are uh, a little bit more about the music itself in a moment. But finally, the choir gets to sing, choir and four solos at the end. And so these are the, the words here. You can kind of read down through them. Um, if you don't recognize the term Elysium, it's more of a mythological term for the heavens, kind of, you know, the afterlife. So it's not, you, and that's one thing we can mention, how you would begin to translate this. But a lot of things kind of talking about freedom, brotherhood, um, you know, this uh, kind of this struggle down in the soul. And I click through this quickly here. References to God, and yet uh, kind of overtones <laughs> of, you know, mythology and the power of nature. So actually, if you go out and study this poem a little bit, which of course, studying the Ninth Symphony, people get into this. Um, it's, it, people will usually say, well, you can kind of build your case. You know, is this really, you know, theologically sound here, or is this some kind of pagan, you know, right? It really is somewhat of a mishmash. And um, I would argue it's, it's kind of a product of the times as the thought in Europe is starting to blend a lot of different ideas. Certainly there's huge Christian momentum coming through the culture, but people are beginning to look at other things. And then, of course, it's poetry. This is not a philosophical treatise that is being argued point by logical point. It's speaking in broader terms. And so to kind of pin somebody on a word, particularly here now, you can find several English translations, of course, of the German. So you really would need to be more of a German scholar to even get into a good argument about uh, the meaning of it. But a broader context here, again, tied together, this fits in the Romantic period. And I would, um, again, connecting it to the theme for the day, what are humans for, that uh, the ro Romanticism, that period in the arts, is a great place to study where um, artists say, we need to go and explore the human emotions. Music had been coming through a variety of things, but just prior to the Romantic period of music is the classical period. And if you've had your music foundation, you know, yes, we use the term classical music in broad strokes for all that violin stuff. But within that, there is a slice, a specific period known as classical music, okay? And classical was written, um, you know, with plenty of kind of structure. There was a craft to music, and these are the rules, and this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to follow structure and make things come together. Well, Beethoven, Mozart starts fiddling with this a little bit, and Haydn, but Beethoven really kind of unleashes this idea, music needs to come from within. You know, there's something to explore inside. Now, sorry, we're not going to make noise, but we're going to start pushing, we're not going to let the rules of structure, and okay, this is how you write a certain form of music. This many bars and this, you start playing with that more. And Beethoven kind of unleashes, um, this is maybe a little overgeneralized, but I would say it unleashes the emotional power of music. And the Ninth Symphony is somewhat of the culmination of that. Um, 
the length of this piece was groundbreaking. Symphonies prior to this had been much shorter. Um, this runs almost 80 minutes. Um, symphonies didn't have four movements. He decided to have a fourth. And the fourth movement itself, what we're mainly familiar with here, the kind of the choral section, is actually, if you break it down, kind of a symphony within a symphony. So Beethoven, and again, you probably recognize his name, really is on that very short list of you know, the greatest musicians of all time, composers, if you want to use that word more specifically. I guess he's not so much a performer as he is a composer, but uh, creating music. Um, and you know, around talk, you can debate, well, you know, Mozart and Bach and those guys. But Beethoven was really out there in front, uh, kind of breaking the mold. Let me read just a couple of more comments from uh, an article that ran I found fascinating magazine. What does Beethoven's Ninth Symphony really mean? And uh, I get into this with most of my students. Some of you may have already been victim of this, um, whether it's you know in art uh, foundations or photography. In the visual arts, um, there's a pretty easy default to uh, content or subject matter, uh, particularly in representational art. Now, if you get into non-representational art, then we're experiencing more just kind of maybe pure design you know, we're after. Or maybe some supposed to do some imaginary work based on a title that's supposed to help us imagine something. But music, when you get into it, if you take the lyrics out of music and you're not playing a tune that is really just a song without words, oh, I know what those words are. But let's say I've got horn concerto in F, okay? What's that supposed to mean? in the sense that we attach meaning to words or to, you know, objects out there. We kind of have a, an iconography, like a house, okay? House kind of can symbolize home and family. We attach meaning to things. But what do we attach to a horn concerto? Well, that, of course, opens up the discussion and all kinds of things. And this author then has come back and said, well, how do we, how do we attach meaning to the Ninth Symphony? He's using this as an example. And really, example for a lot of music, how do we explain how it touches us so deeply? You know, it, it, I mean, it goes way down inside of us. And it's not necessarily, again, always connected to words. Just a couple of things here. Asking what a symphony means is a bit like asking what an eclipse means. One person says it's when the shadow of the moon passes over the sun. Another might say it means the cosmic energy has shifted. My horoscope's about to go haywire. Another says... What's an eclipse? <laughs> uh, if this is true of any old symphony, it is many times more so with Beethoven's Ninth, a monument, an act of violence akin to being squeezed in a mop ringer, a work of art so eloquently and bombastically expressive of something that everyone from Protestant hymn writers to Nazis to the makers of the video game Civilization II has insisted that yes, this is its true meaning. The Ninth is a sphinx to which every earnestly given answer is both right and inadequate. Um, let me just, another half here. Uh, even the best musicologists haven't been able to agree on its meaning. Richard Taruskin called the choral finale a mounting wave, or better, a spreading infection of Elysium Delirium. Maynard Solomon heard the herald of a deity who transcends any particularization of religious creed, a fusion of Christian and pagan beliefs, a marriage of Faust and Helen. Claude W.C., a French composer of the early 20th century, made it out to be a magnificent gesture of musical pride. All would perhaps agree with one thing, Ruskin's assertion that the symphony means something, but that nobody can claim to have arrived at a definitive interpretation. So you can kind of put the meaning thing uh, <coughs> to the side, kind of keep it warm on the back burner. But let's go back to this idea of uh, romanticism again. Um, we're going to transition now and talk about art, show you another short, well, it's actually a shorter clip, and then try to tie the two together. But um, I don't know if any of you have studied literature. There's Romanticism really has its greatest showing in the arts, again, art, music, and literature. Um, so you might be able to connect, make some connections. 
However, an interesting phenomenon is they don't all happen simultaneously. I mean, if you kind of chunk out the calendars in each of those, they are staggered, and yet you can be you can connect the ideas that influence one another. But let's take a minute to watch a piece of, uh, from the archives, actually some VHS tape. I know it's kind of scary. <laughs> um, if we can get everything to behave here. Change the projector around again. For the landscape and placing it in the American imagination. Preeminent among this band of romantic adventurers was the geologist, Clarence King, who was to be found on golden afternoons in October, 1864, mapping the boundaries of the Valley of the Yosemite <coughs> in the California Geological Survey. Apart from his official map-making job, King was a scientist trying to understand the geological forces that had created what he called the Top of California, the rugged Sierra Nevadas. One day, taking a break from surveying, King and his assistant walked across the valley over great slabs of granite worn smooth by glaciers. King heartily enjoyed such jaunts and was the enthusiastic supporter of the strange and dangerous practice of climbing mountains and glaciers simply because they were there, for the sheer excitement and pleasure of it. On this particular afternoon, he began a precarious ascent of the walls of the Yosemite to a place that was to become famous. King was looking for something, some clue or explanation that would vindicate the scientific theory of catastrophism a world suddenly formed by violent titanic forces, earthquakes, volcanoes, melting glaciers. At the top of the canyon, King walked out onto an overhanging rock and found what he was looking for. His description of that afternoon and what he saw is tinged with poetry. For him, the sheer power of nature was mesmerizing. It was impossible for me, as I sat perched upon this jutting rock mass, not to imagine a picture of the glacier period. Granite, ice and snow, silence, broken only by the howling tempest and the crash of falling ice, a splintered rock. These were the elements of a period which lasted immeasurably long. Can there be anything more opposite to that past period than now? All stern sublimity, all geological cataclysm are veiled away behind magic curtains of cloud shadow, broken light. But maps and words and cataclysmic theories were not enough to capture the drama of Yosemite. One needed an image on a gigantic canvas paintings on a grand scale to convey this kind of scenery. The public back east was eager to see such grand landscapes. In 1864, a giant exhibition of art was mounted in New York City to raise money for the wounded soldiers of the Civil War. Ladies and gentlemen, behind the ramparts of the living place which our brothers in arms have formed, we have pursued the giddy chase after wealth. We have bought and sold and gathered our gain as quietly and as serenely as if the peace of the country had never been ruffled. This was quite an auspicious moment for the artist Albert Bierstadt, since one of his greatest paintings, called The Rocky Mountains, was to be judged in these halls and inevitably compared to this huge canvas. This is the heart of the Andes. It was painted by the great Frederick Church, who had already received considerable acclaim for such exotic earthscapes of South American jungles. 
Though the artists were friends, the press heralded the fair as a no-holds-barred contest for public favor, a showdown between giants who both created paintings of gigantic dimensions. I can give you any idea of the scenery of the Rocky Mountains, all of our journey into that region. Oh, I shall be very glad. I found the scenery to be beautiful, and those mountains, they resemble very much the Bernese Alps one of the finest ranges of mountains in all of Europe, if not... What was unique about this kind of painting was that it was both immense and intricate. Visitors to the exhibition brought or rented opera glasses to zero in on the details. The viewer had the feeling of actually being there, lost in the scenery. summits covered with snow, mingling with the clouds. Ah, they present a scene which every lover of landscape may gaze upon with unqualified delight. But for the tormenting swarms of mosquitoes. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Thank you. And that's not all. Nature, beautiful, ageless, and sometimes terrifying was his theme. With the exhibition of the Rocky Mountains, Bierstadt won considerable recognition from the New York elite. He painted his first big landscapes in Europe, paintings like this pastoral view of the Swiss Alps. Then, in the American Rockies, Bierstadt expanded his vision. He was particularly inspired by this high alpine landscape in the Wind River Mountains of Wyoming. But his painting of Island Lake is quite different from the actual sea. He softened the image. The landscape is suffused with a romantic light. Bierstadt created a mythic land based on his own idealized dream. This is one of Bierstadt's most remarkable works. It's not only a testament to the divine grandeur of nature, it's also a memorial to the artist's love for a beautiful woman. The painting is called A Storm in the Rocky Mountains, Mount Rosalie. The inspiration for the work was Rosalie Osborne Ludlow. She became Mrs. Bierstadt after the artist seduced her away from her previous husband, Fitzhugh Ludlow. He was a journalist and a writer of a celebrated book on the drug cult of hashish, and he had been a friend. Ludlow had accompanied the artist on his treks in the West. He created a picture in words of the Rocky Mountains, the same kind of romantic and mystical image that Bierstadt was putting on canvas. An everlasting Sabbath graced the mountains, climbing range on range to the far glittering snow. They were like the stairs of heaven after the lost soul has ascended out of earth. The mountains seemed hopelessly apart from us, like the glories you try and grasp in a dream. Yet it was this very hopelessness that gave them all of a dream's grandeur and made them seem rather like great thoughts than great things. To see the Rocky Mountains in bright sunlight 
to drink from the vast, voiceless happiness which they seem set there to embody is one of the strangest mixtures of pain and pleasure known in all scenery. Within a decade of the Civil War, the no-man's lands that Clarence King pioneered, the unknown regions that Bierstadt painted and Ludlow described, became a magnet for the new adventurers in the West, the tourists. The tourists. I want to look at a couple of Bierstadt's uh, pieces in just a second, but uh, a few phrases there uh, help um, pull out, again, another thing we want to emphasize, and that's the uh, term sublime. Has anybody ever heard the term sublime related to art, what we're talking about? Remember? It's this interesting balance between something that looks so beautiful, attractive, and yet terrifying at the same time. And so, to choose sublime subject matter would be to paint snow-covered mountains with storms. I mean, it's beautiful, and yet at the same time, we know uh, being up there could be our demise. Or we'll see in a minute here, um, Frederick Church, at the same time, is painting a volcano down in South America. Um, I mean, volcanoes in his painting look so beautiful, the colors and the smoke from a distance. And yet we know if we're close, volcanoes are quite destructive. So there's this kind of tension, people painting things that could be very physically threatening, fatal maybe at times, and yet somehow have this strange beauty behind them. The sublime is one of those kind of subpoints again, under romanticism. It's one of that characteristics. In fact, when it comes to landscape painting, I found somebody just uh, described this. Landscape painting went from the pastoral to the sublime. In other words, where the landscape used to look just so nice and peaceful, but now we want to show, in a sense, the edge of that. So let's let get the slides up here. We got to be talking about uh, romanticism. Just a quick comparison here, the old table. But coming out of more classical idea, and you can see how they will cross more leaning towards emotion, feeling, uh, excess, and exuberance. Um, Beethoven writing a longer symphony. He's adding more instruments than usual. Actually, um, one of the first times we hear trombones in a symphony. Usually they've just been put aside for church music, but he's going to use them in symphony, a mass chorus, traditionally you don't have singers in a symphony, that's for something else. So again, this excess. Subjectivity rather than objectivity, um, I'm not sure how I would exactly um, apply that to Beethoven, I'd have to think, but certainly Bierstadt's paintings uh, will mention, these are not photographic scenes in the sense you go stand there and he was accurate at representing it. Most of them are composites. You know, okay, there's a mountain, but then I've changed the foreground and moved things around, changed the light to make a beautiful picture. So that sense of subjectivity. Balance in bad order, proportion, freedom, of course, of expression. Here's Mr. Beardstock. You can decide if the movie guys matched him up very well. His beard looked a little wilder in the other one. But here's the piece they were talking about. Uh, Landers Peak. Let me pull the lights down just a little bit. Maybe you can see that just a little bit. And part of the excess here, again, is this painting is uh, 6 feet by 10 feet. Um, these uh, weren't the first large paintings. People had done large canvases before. But to work uh, something this scale and then to get into the detail in here, we'll show a couple of details, was somewhat groundbreaking. Um, this is the center section, and you can see We've got another close of a minute, but you can see even this attention to little figures here and the reflection of the lake, which you go back for a second, now you can see, oh yeah, okay, this really helps to find the water rather than just, oh, you got water, where's my blue paint? Um, you know, this makes the, all this foreground again, all the detail is down in here. Um, 
And while it looked a little squirrely there in the film, that woman picking up her opera glasses and looking at the painting, that's mentioned in uh, numerous books that people did. I mean, obviously, you can go up and stick your nose on the painting. And so in order to see some of those details of joy, and people were using you know, some kind of optical assistance. And then finally, the mountains in the background. And part of um, the painting term we talk about is atmospheric perspective. In other words, things in the distance aren't quite as sharp. Well, Bierstadt really kind of pushes, fudges on that a little bit, trying to show us, you know, yes, this does look like the distance, certainly because of size, sorry. Um, but he's paying plenty of attention to the individual crags and outcroppings and so on. So that he gives us a real target to look at in the distance. I mean, there's foreground here, you know, all kinds of uh, detail in the middle. His signature shaft of light coming through which we'll mention in a minute, and then some other paintings, and then plenty of detail back here. It's not just some kind of smoky haze. This is what I mentioned as far, prior to uh, uh, Bierstadt and others who started painting the sublime. This is more, we'd say, a pastoral landscape. The painting, American landscape painting, uh, this is kind of the first big wave known as the Hudson River School. Uh, this is technically the Connecticut River here. But Thomas Cole and a group of other painters really tried to capture the American landscape. But they showed it as a, somewhat of as a Garden of Eden idea. Here's a peaceful, beautiful place to live. Okay, that was the set of lenses you looked at the landscape. Um, but then as we start to move towards the sublime, uh, Frederick Church is another one. We'll see another piece of his. But one of his famous works is uh, Niagara Falls. This is a good example. I mean, there's beauty there, and yet the falls are somewhat terrifying. I mean, if you stand there on the edge, if you've been there, that water rushing, or imagine yourself in a boat that is about to go over, there's a sense of fear mixed with the beauty. This is uh, going back a little bit in Bierstadt's um, work, from the, his kind of signature piece there, the Rocky Mountains. A couple years earlier, while well, he's still trying to gain some exposure and get some traction, but the elements are still here. You can see the light coming back in, creating this dramatic scene, towering mountains, and yet, you know, kind of the noble savage here in the foreground, the Indians living in peace with nature, you know, being able to survive. So once again, detail with reflection, taking the time to work all that out. Um, waterfalls, and again, the detail in the rock. So even though these are large paintings, there's plenty of detail in them. Got you know Indians doing their fishing down in front. Uh, this is the one that was also mentioned in the tape, uh, the store in the Rocky Mountains. Even a little more drama here. Um, we'll get a close up in a second and see. We got Indians, I think, chasing some deer down here in the foreground. This illuminated center stage, you know, just this kind of celestial, almost, you know, that the heavens are opening. And then what do we have in the background? Mount Rosalie. You know, all of this storm, and you could get very symbolic here about the, you know, the storm of life and so on, but who, this is his beautiful, you know, love, and there is a Mount Rosalie in Colorado that's part of the story. I mean, it's, it's named back here, but, you know, so clear uh, coming up above the clouds. There, you know, again, the detail, um, you know, working the clouds here, I mean, this is almost you know, the amount of work here, you say, well, that's a really nice painting in itself, the way the clouds have been developed. Foreground, sorry, it's a little dark here in the shadows. We've got the deer and some well, Indians running, one on horseback, I think. And again, the plane with the light here. There's actually a, uh, a subset of artists about this period, you know, kind of under the romantic landscape, called the luminists, who are really into light. They're the ones that want to say, okay, this is painting about landscape, but it's really about the light on the landscape. Um, another large one, the, this is 7 by 12 feet, and again, plenty of emphasized reflection and dramatic light. More details on the net. Foreground. Another great piece of Mount 
right here. And finally, his immigrants uh, crossed the plains of Oregon Trail, which um, I'm surprised we didn't put in the uh, tape series because this really does paint the um, well, the westward experience as kind of this mythic quest, um, you know, headed for the land of Eden. The whole tape series here, again, it's an 80s thing, was called The West of the Imagination. And so it's really talking about how we imagined the West and that propelled us to explore and how the arts portrayed it. And they look at a whole bunch of different people, but certainly the, the visual arts. And Bierstadt is one of those who, as you imagine those people standing there looking at those paintings, that's the only thing they have to go on. Right? Okay, it's always a good reminder, here in the 21st century, we are inundated with images. We can see pictures of anything. But if you go back to the Civil War, black and white photography is just starting. Most people didn't vacation in the West, since there wasn't a very good way to get there yet. And so all you do is hear about the mountains of the West. And so to be able to see a painting, this kind of thing really defines it in people's minds about what you know, this looks like. And you can see how that would propel their imagination. Let's see what, how we're doing on time here. Well, it looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I'd like to, I think I'd like to show the um, last couple minutes of the Beethoven film, kind of bring it to a conclusion. But first, before I do that, any questions that you're just itching to ask before we go on or something I can clarify? Okay. Again, the, the premise here, trying to tie it to the title today, What Are Humans For?, is uh, here we would say to express, you know, to create our, that being human is to create. And the Romantic era is one of those highlights of where creativity kind of breaks off in a new direction. And Beethoven and Bierstadt make some grand statements here with their paintings and their music. Um, both had the, the luck here of actually being uh, popular and well-received while they were alive. Beethoven was highly respected, and people were very anxious to hear his newest compositions. Um, when, the Beethoven, when the Ninth debuted, uh, there was a scramble for tickets. It was kind of limited to you know, the uppity-ups who could get in. Uh, Bierstadt set records for selling his paintings while he was alive. He was commanding the highest prices of anybody for painting in the U.S., the funny thing about Bierstadt, though, is he died um, kind of in obscurity because this style of painting by the 1870s was on its way out. I mean, some of these are right at the end of this popularity with the rise of Impressionism. And people's taste started to change. And as more people went west, they saw the actual thing. And these didn't provide that key spark of imagination that they did originally. Bierstadt has since regained a reputation in the 20th century as people studied him. So let's watch the last few minutes of the movie. Get the right clickers here. <coughs> place in 1989, Leonard Bernstein took an opportunity to conduct Beethoven's Nines in East Berlin on December 25th. And uh, a very unique thing was that he changed the word joy to freedom. 
the word Freude to Freiheit. That line and the complete O to joy for me is all human beings are equal. No one is less and no one is more. No one is better, no one is worse. We were all singing and like kissing. I got a French kiss from a guy I, I never met in my whole life, but I did it. I, we were like so um, ecstatic about it that it just didn't matter. When the wall came down, I was very young. And we, the younger generation, was just like, the world is ours. I had all these crazy dreams, what I want to do. I want to work in hotels all over the world, and I want to fly there, and I want to see that. And I was not afraid of anything. And I just did it. It completely changed my life, it changed myself, and how I looked at life and what I wanted from life and what I can do, what I'm capable of. We embrace harmony. Making consensus, talking with others is important in the Japanese culture. Japanese love doing things together. together and you make harmony and you feel as if we are all friends. You need to sing daiku in order to understand how the singers feel after the concert. I don't know, even after, after we finish, we still we have daiku song in our body, in, 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 in our mind, in our soul. When people have to go somewhere, this is the woman who was the place Chile. that we didn't choose is the feeling that you are nowhere. And uh, I am a very lucky person. I am very privileged because uh, after 24 years, Munster is my second land. But I feel I belong to two pieces of earth and I, I belong everywhere. <laughs> but it's this uh, pain is always inside. <laughs> this lost paradise that I take in my hands everywhere where I go.
mine uh, was brought here the same day than me in uh, 1975. And now she is the president of the Republic. Michelle Bachelet was brought here on the same day than, than me. I'm glad she was released in good shape. But many didn't, didn't make it, as you can see. All of them were sitting here for the last time. You know something? They could not defeat us. They never could. basically death when he wrote this. Alright, we're done. Thank you very much. Don't forget the rest of the session.